Hello, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to Liquid Brain. So today I want to talk specifically about looping uh, and how do I, you make your code either use less memory or run faster. So all this will be based on the book actually I found online. I think it's best practice in R. So you can actually go to the original article here on this link and you can actually find the the, the code that I'm using right now in my GitHub repo, which I'll put the link in the video description uh, down below. Okay, so let's just get started. So before I actually run anything, I usually like to clear my environment just to make sure there's no contamination from the previous code or environment they're using in. Just make sure that you don't have anything important before you start running. So let's start with the first things. Uh, what is a loop? So a loop is where you tell the computer to do something over and over and over again. And a lot of time when we do something on a computer, this is actually very, very common. So how do you do that is through two main functions. There's a lot more, but we're not going to cover them here. Uh, the one that I almost always use is a for loop, where we'll talk about the syntax later. And the other one that you will sometimes find in other people's um, code or functions is a while loop. So a, a for loop actually looks like this. So for a certain value from one value to another, uh, do a certain things. And while loop is also very similar where if a certain number is sent a certain thing, do that. Okay, it's, it's very vague to look at the syntax, but there are two examples that I put in here. So in this case, you can look at for loop is from line 34 to line 36. I'm not, I hope it's not too small. Let's just make it a little bit bigger so that it's easier for everyone. Okay, so for a for loop, um, how do you read that is that for i, when i is 1 to 5, print the i, okay? In this case, every time it runs one number, you go to the next number and next number and next number and so on. So in total, you run it five times and every time it runs, you print it out. So that will be the first five value that you see over here. So for a while loop, Conceptually, very, sim very similar, but you have to do a little bit more work because they're not um, built into the system. So in this case, um, you have to declare J first. So in this case, I and J, just to make, just make things less confusing between the two loops. Uh, when, so initially, J is equals to zero. When J is smaller than five, print J. And after you print the J, you remember you have to manually add it up one by one. Otherwise, it won't understand that you have to add and it will constantly be running the same loop where J is equal to zero. So that will be what we call an infinite loop, where a loop that never ends. Okay. So I personally like to use for more than while because you have to declare less stuff. It is more vectorized. It is also easier to, to comprehend. I think it's also more popular in other languages like JavaScript or uh, Python and so on. So everything below will be specifically about for loop and how you do it. But the, the, the concept of both are actually very similar. Okay, so just now we'll talk about numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But the other special thing about R and for loop is that you can actually run it from a list. So in this case, I have a list called uh, Hello, how do you do today? I hope you're doing well. And I don't know why it doesn't run. Let's just do it again. Okay, so this is a list of six different characters. Hello, how do you do today? And you can also uh, illiterate through this list and print them out one by one. Okay, so the first round you put in hello, the first second round you put in how and so on and so forth until the whole list has been printed out. So it's the same concept just now, just that instead of numbers, you can use the indexes in any kind of list and you fit in that thing in, in that loop. Okay, uh, of course it doesn't restrict yourself to, to uh, characters. You can also put objects inside and illiter illiterate two individual objects in the for loop. Okay, so um, some other thing that you might need to know is interrupting the loop and skipping of elements. Okay, so um, the first one I want to introduce is break, which is if this thing happens, break the loop directly and just, just stop doing things. Okay, the other one is that if you meet this character, go to the next element and um, yeah, just go to the next element and don't run anything below the break line. Okay, so if you run this, you realize that da -da -da, for the first one, when one is for one to five, uh, break when i equals to two. Okay, so you can, you can see that the first round, i equals to one, didn't break, so you print. For the second round, i equals to two, so it breaks the loop, so it, 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 this, this whole loop just gets stopped halfway, 
and it doesn't go through. So for the second one is very similar. So if i equals to do, we'll break the loop. So if we go back to our list, so hello, it'll be fine, it's printed. How, it'll be printed. Uh, if it do, then it take a do and it breaks the list, so it stops printing afterwards. So remember, the sequence of your break and the print are also very important on whether you print first or you break first. Just keep that in mind. So the next one is uh, next, which is actually uh, skip a certain elements within your list. So in this case, uh, when it's equals to two, I want to skip to the next element. So in this case, you can see that the output is one, three, four, five, because when i is equals to two, we skip that loop and it will not get printed out over here. So there are many ways you can do that. Just keep in mind that this thing exists and you see it in other people's code, you know, don't get too frightened by it. So similarly with the second one where we'll skip the hello, but we'll also print out the, the rest of the rest of the element. So if I put print above this, uh, it will essentially not be doing anything because it will print out before it skips. So just make sure that if you want to skip a certain element from execution, put it above the function that it would actually run. Okay, so you can see hello is not skip, so not very useful over here. So that's the basic uh, structure and syntax of looping. So now we're gonna talk about how to make your loop more efficient. So everything we talk about above is like five steps, six steps, uh, 10 steps, very, very small. So uh, when you have a data size or calculation that are computationally simple, the, the efficiency saving maybe not that significant, you know, two for seconds versus one second barely make any difference. But if you have a, um, a run that is one hour, a 50 minute run and a one hour run make a significant difference. If you have a one month render, one month execution, one month versus 28 days is a huge difference, even though percentage wise it doesn't seem to be. So um, if you have small things, they're not necessary, but when your data size get bigger and bigger, especially when we do things like single cell RNA, we do big data, yeah, th these are really important. So these are five main things that I, I pick out on to do. So the first one is called don't make object you don't use. If you don't need a certain things, uh, don't do that. And then other four, I'll go through it one by one with you. So the first one, don't make object you don't use. So in this case, I have make two examples. Uh, you can see that uh, P1 and P2 essentially are not important because they doesn't need to exist, which is spelled wrongly over here. Let me just fix it right now. Yeah, so P1 and P2, in comparison, you realize that both of the code run the same thing because you can just substitute this P1 with I and substitute this P2 with 25. And you can essentially make the code shorter and faster to run. Remember, every single declaration, every single line of code takes a certain amount of time. And if you do it enough, you know, you will actually see the difference. Okay, so this is also part of, let's say, memory management. So you're duplicating the I and also you're duplicating the, the code of number 25. So they have to calculate it twice and you have to store it twice amount of memory to, to run the same amount of code. Okay, so this is the first one. Just keep in mind, we're gonna come back to this uh, afterwards. So the second one is called garbage collections. I'm not sure technically I'm using it right or not, but the concept is similar. If you don't need a certain thing after the calculation, uh, remove it from the code. Um, in this case, the removal of the code will slow things down uh, computationally, but it will um, result in you using less amount of RAM when you run Though a lot of things at the same time. So remember, uh, we're, we're dealing with like a very small number here. Again, if you run my code, it will not make too much of a difference. But in some way, the, the, the calculation or computation that you do, the least object that you fit it in, is maybe three gigabytes, five gigabytes. And when you are loading things that are one or five gigabyte in size, uh, everything matters because we have a limited amount of RAM and we want to do that. So yeah, so fundamentally, um, it will make this will make your things slower, but it will sp save some of the space, essentially. So the other one is how you can uh, prevent that kind of situation is we don't. Uh, if you only need to run a certain thing once, uh, don't put it in a loop. So the same example up here. Can you see that P equals when you assign twenty five to P two is essentially inside the loop means you'll run it five times. 
but every time it is running the same thing, which is P2 equals to 25. So when you can detect something like this, you can actually put it outside the loop and they are just, yeah, that they're, they're, they're just not important. Similarly with the removal of P1, P2 and P3, you can also put it after the loop, uh, just in case that you, because it, and essentially they are get overwritten anyway. So you can also put it after the loop so that you remove within the loop or after loop. Depends on how your function actually works and how your, um, yeah, how, how, how your function actually works. It, it, there's a different way to do it. Okay, so declaring object before the loops will essentially save four calculation cycles of assigning P equals 25 and on the long term save a lot of time. So yeah, now I'm gonna introduce a new function called system time. I think you already seen this in the multi-threading video where you measure the amount of time uh, required to run a certain function. So you can see that system time, uh, everything wrapped in the system time, you try to measure before and after um, what is the total time needed to do all this thing. Okay, so let's just start with uh, this cycle. So this one is what we call a using simple data types, which is if you don't need it to be a list, uh, you don't actually, yeah, you don't, if you don't need it to be a data frame, you can use an integer, use an integer instead. So um, what I'm gonna do is that the cycle I'm gonna define as one to uh, 10,000. So let me just turn off this one. Yeah, so I'm gonna run a cycle of one to 10,000, which I'm gonna fit it to my for loop later. So just in case, why do I do that? So that the three, um, three for loop will remain the same cycle every time I change this one, same situation. I don't have to re-declare the same code and make things easier to read. Okay, so here I remove um, I, so I, I, so from the previous example, I take P2 out from the loop just to save a little bit of time. But the first one, I declared it as a data frame. Sorry, actually the first one and two, I declared P2 as a data frame. But the third one, uh, P2 is a numerical. Okay. So the second thing is that the first cycle has P1 as another step of declaration, but this one doesn't. Okay, so let's just run the, the cycle and see how long it takes. So for the first one, it's the slowest example. We're using the whole data frame as P2 and we are adding the P2 to 20, 25. Uh, sorry, we're adding I to P2 and we see what happens. And the second one, I take out just one single line, which is P1 equals to I and I use I directly in the cycle. And for the third one, I just change the data frame data type to a um, a numerical data type. So basically a data structure into a very single, very simple elements. So you can see that the first two uh, doesn't save a significant amount of time just by reducing a single step over here. Again, if you reduce, increase the size, the 0.1 over here might make a huge difference. But just by removing a data frame and put it as a numerical, uh, there's less computational thing that they have to do for the addition over here. And essentially it will shave down five seconds into zero seconds. So I'll, I'll say that in normal situation, you won't purposely put a single number as a data frame, but sometimes when you subset things, uh, remember to do this step uh, just to make sure that it, it doesn't retain, the, the single element that you extract from data frame doesn't retain the data structure as a data frame. So this might actually be something of concern, which I have personally done before if I'm not wrong. Okay, so the second one is to declare the size of the output period to the loops, which I am guilty of doing this last time before. So what you're supposed to do is that you are making an output of a million, uh, of a million numerical numbers. Make sure you declare it first before you start looping a loop. Don't add things sequentially throughout the loop. Okay, so, so this is basically what I do here. Um, so I declare cycles to one to a million, I think one to a million. I declare P2 equal to 25, doesn't matter. And first of all, I remove P3 just to prevent the contamination from the previous run, okay? So in the first um, run, I declare P3 as an empty list, and then I try to illiterate to one to a million, and the time it takes is about 0 0.03, uh, sorry, wrong cycle time. It shouldn't be that fast. <laughs> So remove P3 and the first step I remember will take about a few seconds to run. Uh, yeah, 2.9 seconds by declaring an empty list and every single step it will add one to the list. 
Okay, do it a million times. And then the second one, I will declare P3 first with a million number. So the P3 here, you can already see on the object. I don't think you can see, but P3 here already have a million object within it. So what we do is that every cycle, we just replace one element at a time. So you can see that now it's much, much faster. So just a general comparison again, the first run takes three seconds and the second run only takes 3.85 and 0.19 seconds. Just by doing one single step, you can actually essentially shave down a lot of your time. Okay, so uh, in summary, this is what you do. Uh, calculate the result before the loop means that you declare the output of it or do any kind of declaration you want outside of the loop. Yeah, initiate the object before the loop. Uh, illiterate as few number as possible. If you don't need to do that certain loop, don't do it. And use as simple data type as you can and write as little function inside a loop as possible. Yeah. So one, one other thing, so that's basically the, the efficient way of doing looping on single training but actually there is of course um, parallel computing which is you, you you know if you have 128 core might as well using it uh, but here is not going to be a very good example because i can't run this in real time so this is also this is just an example of run um, we'll calculate the square root of this number for 10,000 times and the normal um, for loop you can run it in this way uh, it takes about 0 0.1 seconds, very fast. But if you actually run it in parallel run, uh, yeah, through, you know, the do's no function, making cluster, yeah, sorry, um, two cluster means two computing, uh, two CPU core, and we run it through all this function to make sure that it is um, running in two computing core, you realize that it takes actually 4.7 seconds. Uh, so yeah, it's not, it's not a very good example, but you can think about it when it depends on what you do. And for small calculation like this, it's not worth the effort to parallelize your computing, but you're doing, for example, single cell RNA, 25 gigabyte, 30 gigabyte runs. Uh, doing it will make a significant difference. So again, if you want to know more about parallel computing, I would suggest you watch the other video about that specifically. But basically today is just about efficient looping, which we talk about uh, two type of loop, for, for loop and while wow loop, mainly for loop, and their syntax is as above. Uh, you can also use a list in for loop. You can interrupt them, you can do a next, you can skip a certain things and find main efficient looping method, just to remind everyone. Uh, don't make object that you don't use. Uh, garbage collection, removal object after you've done using them. Initiate the object before the loop, declare them before the loop. Use very simple data type or data structure and declare the size of the output period to the loop. That's basically all I want to say today. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you learned something. And if I'm wrong about anything, again, put a comment down below and we'll thank you everyone for watching. See you next one. Bye.